one of the ways I like to look at this is, and even a few of these functions, is let's put ourselves in the shoes of a uh, uh, early statistician that is looking for a way to compare categorical data, especially like for starters, two categories, uh, you know, like an exposure, like you're exposed to the, you know, to water, dirty water and uh, you're drinking uh, a polluted water, you're not drinking polluted water and some out outcome, like you get typhoid or you don't get typhoid. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to simplify it a bit for, for our purposes. And uh, I'm going to look at uh, uh, what, how we might organize information like that. So I'm going to start with, uh, with a population where um, uh, uh, we, we exam we're interested in examining people that have chronic coughs, chronic cough. Okay, let's say in this population that the prevalence of chronic coughs is 20%, right? Okay, so um, that's pretty high prevalence, right? Okay, let's say it's 20% for argument's sake. I don't want to update anything now, no. Funny the way that always comes up at the worst times. But at any rate, um, so I'm going to take a sample from this population of 200 people. So if the prevalence is 20%, I expect to get 40 people that have a chronic cough. Total of 40 people have chronic cough. So out of the 200 people, I expect to find, if 40 of them have a chronic cough, I would expect 160 of them don't have a chronic cough, right? So now I say to myself, oh, that's, that's interesting. But now let's examine the people within this population a little bit more closely. I'm going to look to see whether people that are left-handed are more likely to have a chronic cough than people that are right-handed, right? Well, that's, that's a ridiculous proposition, right? And I'm, I'm picking that specifically because we would not expect to see any association between hand in this and chronic cough. But I'm going to say, okay, let's say, let's go examine these people. Let's go back and take another look at these 200 people and divide them up into two groups. Let's filter out the people or factor out the people that are left-handed from the people that are right-handed. So I'm going to set up a, uh, a table. Okay, and we call this either cross tabs or contingency table, um, and it's familiar to us because it's similar to what we were doing when we were doing the uh, uh, diagnostic tests. Okay, uh, let me just check with guys online, make sure that they can see my uh, page and that they uh, uh, can hear me. Can you guys uh, hear me and uh, see the page? Okay. Okay, good. I feel much better now. All right, so I'm gonna I'm gonna break this up. I'm going to get into the habit of putting the exposure in the rows. In other words, the factor that I'm looking at to see if there's some association. So I'm going to say, okay, this is handedness in the rows, left-handed people and right-handed people. And this is the outcome is going to be on the top, like illness, like chronic cough or no chronic cough. Okay, I'm going to organize it that way from now on. The disease or the outcome in the columns, the exposure in the rows. It, ha it helps to get into, you know, a habit if you're going to do a lot of these analyses to kind of organizing it the same way so you don't confuse yourself. So let's see. I said that uh, I, there were a total of 200 people. 40 of them had a chronic cough and uh, uh, 160 of them did not have a chronic cough, right? So let's, let's say that out of the, uh, 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 out of the uh, 200 people – 80 of them were left-handed, and 120 of them were right-handed. Probably isn't really the real proportion in, real, in a real population, but it's okay for us to work with it. So now, if I, assume, if I assumed in the beginning, well, we, we didn't even really assume it, we could see that based on our sample of 200 people, it looks like 40 out of 200, or 20% of the population has a chronic cough, right? So if I have 80 people that are left-handed, and... I'm going to start with the assumption that there is no association between left-handed and having chronic cough, but, but the prevalence is 20%. How many of those 80 people would I expect to have a chronic cough? 20%, right? How many is that? Right. Uh, it's going to be 20, it's going to be 16 people, correct? Am I right? Okay. Right? 20% of 80, right? Or 0.2 times 80 is going to be 16 people. So how many people would I expect wouldn't have a chronic cough? Well, basically the difference, right, which is going to be 64 people. Okay, so let's do the same thing with the people 
that are right-handed. If the uh, if if the prevalence is twenty percent, how many of those hundred and twenty people would we expect to have chronic cough? Well, twenty percent of twenty-four, twenty-four people, right? And that we would expect ninety-six people to not have a chronic cough, right? That is our. I'm not even gonna, just going to call it that. Our expected result. Now, this is a perfect situation, right? If the population were exactly like this, and this is what we got, it would be it would be a per, it, we would get very lucky if we took 200 people in a population where 40% um, uh, of them were left-handed and where chronic cough was 20%, and there was no association. This would be the perfect uh, uh, outcome in terms of a sample for me to get. Problem with it is is that it's never really perfect, is it? So if I took if I'm going to make another table over here. If I actually went into this population, and let's say that this were true, that there's no association, that the prevalence is 20%, and I'm going to look at left-handed people and right-handed people, and I got 80 left-handers and 120 right-handers, right? What would be the likelihood that I would get exactly 16 and 24 left-handers that have a chronic cough? Does that seem very likely to you? I mean, it's more, it'd be more likely than getting a, a number much different, but by itself to get that perfect outcome would not be very likely. It's kind of like, remember we were flipping a coin, flip a coin a hundred times, right? How many heads would you expect to get? 50. But if you actually did it, would you really expect to get exactly 50? No, actually it's more common for you to get a little less than or a little more than 50 than exactly 50. Well, this works out the same way. If I were to actually do this, I might wind up with, instead of uh, 16 left-handers, I might wind up with 14 left-handers. And I might wind up with uh, 22, 26 right-handers, right? Or I might wind up with 20 left-handers and 20 right-handers, right? So I would expect to maybe get an outcome that's a little bit different than a perfect outcome. But if I started to see a really big difference, like if I saw only eight people in my left-handed group and 32 people in my right-handed group, the bigger this difference becomes, the more I, I suspect that there is a, some association between handedness and uh, 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 whether or not a person has a chronic cough, right? So, so my, my uh, uh, concern here is, is that a small difference is okay, but the bigger the difference becomes, the less likely that that difference is due to chance, right? Like a flipping a coin a hundred times or something like that. So I'm looking for a difference between my expected values in a population and my observed values in that same population, right? I want to see if there's a difference between the two of them. And the way I'm going to do that is I'm actually going to kind of, I'm going to look for a tool that I can use to measure how big that difference is. So I'm actually going to open an Excel file here. And this Excel file, <clears throat> I'm going to call this a tuna surprise. How many, how many of you guys ever go to like a church, like luncheon or dinner or something like that, right? You know, stay away from anything that's made with mayonnaise. Stay away from it, right? You know, bad things happen. You're sunny, you know, you're at the, uh, you know, it takes a while, it gets warm and stuff like that, right? So, you know, things can go, things can go wrong quick. Right, with anything with mayonnaise on it. So tuna surprise, you know, you can not, it can be the wrong kind of surprise. Well, okay. So now let's say that we have a situation where, uh, uh, you know, people at the uh, we find out people got sick at the event, and we're concerned. We want to try and figure out was it the tuna surprise that caused the illness. Well, you know what happens with that kind of stuff too is is that when word gets around that a lot of people had gastrointestinal problems. Well, you know, kind of pe other people have like a sympathetic reaction too. So you get other people that maybe didn't need to tune surprise, you know, but not as many that you, you would expect. So we want to test whether or not uh, eating the tuna surprise, that exposure was associated, was, was associated with getting sick or not getting sick. Okay. Whether, whether eating it or not eating it. Okay. So we do a survey. We find 90, uh, uh, 98 people from the, uh, that attended this, that we could actually track down. Turns out 46 of them ate the tuna surprise. 52 of them didn't eat the tuna surprise. Okay. And, uh, we found 
that 19 out of the 46 reported they got sick, that ate the tuna surprise, and only 10 out of the 52 that didn't need it reported getting sick. Okay, so this is self-reported. So again, you know, sometimes uh, there could be other reasons for them to report they didn't feel well, right? So now we want to examine that. Is, is, is there an association between eating the tuna surprise or not eating it and whether or not you got sick? Well, these are my observed values. These are actually what happened. This is what occurred in this population. So now I'm going to take another look at this from the other perspective. What would my expected values be for these exposures? Okay, so first of all, what's the prevalence? Okay, what would be the prevalence of illness for this particular group? Okay, well, its total number of people is 98. How many of them got sick? Uh, 29 reported getting sick out of um, um, uh, 69 that didn't get sick. Oops, 69. Okay, I got my math right there, right? So the prevalence is actually 29 out of 98. So 30%, roughly 30% of the people that we tracked down reported getting sick overall, without regard to whether they ate the tuna surprise or not, just overall, right? 29 out of 98. Okay, so now I want to say to myself, okay, let's say we had 46 people that ate the tuna surprise and 52 people that didn't eat the tuna surprise, right? What would I, if, if the prevalence is 30%, 30% of people got sick, what would I, if there's no association, these are what I would expect, be, expect if there's no association. If there's no association, how many people would I expect to get sick out of 46? Well, the prevalence is roughly 30%, right? So it's going to be equal to about 46 times 30% or about 13.8 people. Kind of a weird thing happened there, didn't it? One of the weird things is, is that the expected values are not whole numbers, right? Because we're multiplying by the prevalence. How about the 52, right? What would you expect to get sick there? I would expect to get uh, 52 times 0.3, right? Same prevalence, right? Oops, what I do there? Times 0.3, it's really 0.29, but I'm, like, uh, I'm, uh, I'm uh, 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 just making it a little easier for us. And the difference, how many people didn't get sick, well, I, that would be 70% times the 0.46, or I can just say it's equal to the 46 minus the number of people that got sick. Might be a little easier. It's equal to 52 minus the 15.6. And if I add these things up, right, the sum of these two, oops, an equal sign in there. <clears throat> okay, and I got to copy that across. Okay, and equals sum of all of these. Okay, comes out to basically the same thing, right? Except now, I, this this really comes out. The reason why this is not twenty nine exactly is because I I. I rounded it right, okay? It would have normally been 29 exactly. Okay, so now, how am I going to evaluate if that's a big enough difference for us to say that I think that there's an association? I don't think it's an accident that more people that ate the tuna surprise got sick. Well, we're going to create a statistic. We're going to call that chi-square. The symbol for chi-square is a capital, kind of a capital X squared. Okay, Greek letter chi, right? So we're going we're gonna to develop a, uh, uh, a statistic. And as we said, our level of confidence that there is a difference for, that there's an association between whether they ate it or not and getting sick um, uh, is going to be defined by how big the difference is between these numbers. Uh, is what we saw, is what we saw, uh, what we observed, is it different from what we expect? Okay, simplest way for me to describe if it's different is to just simply take each cell. I'm going to take this cell up here, 19, my observed value minus my expected value, which was 13.8, right? And that's going to be equal to 5.2. Then I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to look to see how big the difference is between the next cell, the next two cells. That's equal to um, a 10 minus my expected value, which is whatever that was, okay? 
Next one I'm going to say is going to be um, equal to um, uh, number of people that were not sick in my observed values versus uh, minus the ones that were not sick in my expected values. And then finally, I'm going to do uh, not sick and uh, did not eat the tuna uh, minus uh, what it was in my expected values, my observed values, my expected values. So all I did was take the difference for each of those four cells, right? And the bigger those, if those differences had been 10 or 12, I would have been even more comfortable because I'm looking for a big difference between the two groups, between the observed values and what I would have expected. So one way for me to add this all up, one way for me to combine all this and get one big number to represent it, a value, like a statistic, is to just take the sum of all these. Anybody want to tell me what's going to happen when I take the sum of all these? I'm going to get zero, right? So that doesn't do us any good, right? So traditionally, in statistics, when we get stuck into this corner, what do we do? We're going to create an absolute value or we're going to square it. In this case, we're going to square it. We're going to take the observed values. Now, look at this formula for chi-squared. It's the sum of each one of these cells. It's the observed value minus the expected value squared, and then we're going to divide it by the expected values. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to just square each one of these values is equal to uh, uh, this value times itself, right? And then I'm going to just copy that down and left. Fill down and fill right. I hope this works. Okay, I think it did work. Okay. C14 times C14. Uh, yeah, I think it worked, right? I think that worked. Okay, so those are my those are my uh, my observed minus my expected values squared. It's the it's the numerator in this fraction, right? Okay, so now I'm going to add them all together because I I want the sum of all those. Except before I do that, each one of those values has to be divided by my expected value. That brings it down back into the range of numbers that I started with, right? These with these automatically are artificially inflated numbers. Those differences because I squared it. So now let's take each one of these numbers and take that number and uh, divide it by the expected value, which was for that cell, which was 13.8. And I'm going to take this number and, uh, uh, whoops, excuse me, equals uh, 31.36 uh, uh, divided by the expected value for that cell, 15.6. And I'm going to take this number equals... You can find probably a more elegant way to do this than I'm doing it. Okay, uh, uh, divided by the expected value of 32 for that cell, and then finally uh, 31.36 divided by the expected value for that cell. Okay, and now I've taken all of these. I've taken each one of these, found the observed minus uh, expected value for each cell, squared it, and divided it by the expected value. And I have all four of those listed over here. So now I'm going to take the sum of all the differences of the cells. So the sum of all these things, oops, equals sum. Take the sum of all these cells, and it comes up with a number 5.67. Okay, so now, okay, that sounds chi squares equal to, could it be that simple? And it is. That's how you calculate chi square. That's it. Not any more complicated than that. We're going to talk about some other issues maybe as we go on because, you know, we're statisticians. We like to complicate things. Otherwise, why would they need statisticians, right? One of the issues here, there's a few issues in terms of how to interpret this data. One is we like to work with big numbers in this data. One rule for starters is the, none of the expected values can be smaller than five. We're okay on that, right? It's a big enough sample for that. Okay, the other rule, there's other issues as well. One of them is, you notice how we got um, uh, numbers that were not whole numbers here for expected values, right? Well, remember that in the real population, the prevalence could be 31.39 or something like that, percent, or 0.39147 or something, right? So since we're counting real people, we'll never get a number that's not, that's fractional, in the observed values, they're always going to be whole numbers. So one of the things we might want to do is account for the fact that that 19 could really be 18 and a half, or it could really be 19 and a half, right? It, that should have been in there, you know, if, if I could really 
count if I really made the sample gigantic. In, in real life, it'd be more like 195 or 185. We're summarizing, we compacted it down to 19 by virtue of the fact the sa sample was small. Well, in that case, we actually, there's another version of this where we do a what's called a continuity co correction, where we take each one of these cells and before we actually co calculate the value that's in the cell, we take the observed value minus the expected value, subtract 0.5 from it, like 5.5, 5.2 minus 0.5, right? You know, for that difference between that swing could have been above and below the whole number, and then square that and divide it by the expected value. So what is that? That makes the number always a little bit smaller. So it's a more conservative approach to this. For our purposes for now, we're going to ignore that. We don't, we're not going to worry about the continuity correction. Okay? But, but So we calculated a value of chi-square. So now, at this point, we have to decide whether or not that number, that chi-square value that we calculated, is a big enough number for us to say with some level of certainty that there really is an association, right? Uh, 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 if it were zero, we wouldn't say there's an association because there's absolutely no difference between the two groups, observed and expected. If it's one, then there was a small difference. If it's two, a bigger one, three, a bigger one, four, a bigger one, five, a big one. The bigger this number is, the bigger must have been the differences between the observed values and the expected values. Well, the next question is, how big is enough? Okay, so we want a number that's big enough that... If there's no association, by mistake, just by virtue of the fact we took the sample uh, and our observed values were off, you know, from what they really should have been, uh, uh, we want that only to occur, that, that situation where we would say that that number is big enough, uh, where we would say reject. Our null hypothesis, by the way, would be that uh, there's no association or alternative hypothesis, there is association. Uh, we want the probability of rejecting that null hypothesis to be relatively small. What's our acceptable level of error for rejecting our null hypothesis? What do you think? 10%, 20%, 3%, 5%, right? As, as most other analyses, unless we want to make it more rigorous, we could make it 1%. But we want to be 95% sure that we don't reject the null hypothesis in error. Right, because that's a type one. That's a bad error. Type one error, whatever. That would mean that we're going to blame the poor woman that brought the tuna salad to the thing. We're going to blame her for poisoning the entire church luncheon. Right. So, so, so we want to be sure. If it's her, we want to pin it on her, and we want to make sure we're not accusing her wrongly. Of course, we're willing to take a five percent chance of you know, making this woman notorious. Right. Yes. So <laughs> that's a level of uncertainty we're willing to accept. So now, what's the relationship here? Well, in fact, there, there is a way, there is a uh, distribution that we can rely on to tell us uh, whether or not uh, that this, this is a likely outcome. Okay, so let me just go up here where I can get to it. And let me see where these are going to be. Okay, I think they're going to be in here. Okay, no, that, not that one. Uh, let me see. Formulas, maybe I put them in. Okay, I think they're in here. Okay, so. Okay, now here's one of the graphs here. In fact, I think I got a better one here somewhere. I know I downloaded them. Interactive, ba, ba, ba. no, no, no. Okay. I, I don't want to get to this one right away. I want to show you, I want to show you a simpler one first. Okay, I'm going to go on chi square. Uh, 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 distribution. Okay, let me get some images here. Let me get a simple one. Okay, okay here's a good simple one. Right here. This is basically the way that this distribution looks. You get one that's maybe has some numbers on it. Uh, yeah, let's look at this one. See this distribution I have behind me? The number line here represents the number, the value of chi-square. Right over here, it's zero, right? The, the, it would be zero. Actually, this should be up on here a little bit. The height of this represents the probability of getting that outcome. 
So actually, it's not very likely that you're going to get exactly a zero for chi-square anytime you actually really do a study with a lot of people, right? But you, it is likely that you will get a value that's small, like one or two. And then as the number gets bigger and bigger, the likelihood of its occurring gets smaller and smaller. And in fact, the area here to the right of whatever chi-square value is the probability that you would get that value if there's no association between the, the exposure and the outcome. So we want the chi-square to be so big that it is far out on this cur far out on this distribution, right? This is our for, this is our, our substitute for the normal distribution. This is the distribution for chi squares. We want it to be so far out that there's less than five percent chance of it getting that outcome uh, if there's no association, right? Well, there's a little bit of a problem there, and that is that if you can imagine if there were if, if there were more than two boxes, if it was more than two by two, the number would be bigger. Right. Just by virtue of the fact that that is if we're a two by two, for two by three table, there would be six differences we'd add together. If it was a three by seven table, there would be 21, whatever, 21 differences we'd add. So it's going to naturally be a bigger number. So, in fact, there is a different chi square distribution for. For different sample sizes. Okay. So the chi square distribution we're working with is going to be very close to this first one, right? Or closest to this first one. And these others are for larger and larger values, uh, you know, of, of the number of boxes that we're dealing with. Okay, now, the way that we decide which one of these graphs to use or which one of these distributions to use is, is that we base it on the sample size. In this case, kind of the sample size. In this case, what we're basing it on is the number of cells that we're working with. And the number of degrees of freedom in chi-square is equal to the number of rows minus one times the number of columns minus one. So for us, in this particular situation, we've got two rows and two columns, right? We have ate the tuna or didn't eat the tuna. We have got sick or didn't get sick. So it's two minus one is one times two minus one is one. So we're dealing with one degree of freedom here. So we need a table that describes the probability of that curve for one degree of freedom. And in fact, we do have a table like that. Okay, let me see if I can't get it. Oops, oops, oops. Okay, let me see where my table is. You know, I have these in all these different folders here, but I lost track of where I put them. Maybe it's in here. Yep, I think it's here. Uh, table. Yeah, I think, yeah, there we go. Okay. So here is a table that shows me the probability of exceeding the critical value of chi. In other words, how big a chi do you have to have in order to say that that chi square is big enough for that it would only come up in less than 5% of the cases if there was no association? So let's see, for one degree of freedom, for a 2 by 2 table, for a 5% chance of being wrong, rejecting the, the hypothesis incorrectly, my chi-square value would have to be, or less than a 5% chance, my chi-square value would have to be 3.841. Okay, what was my chi-square value here? Anybody remember? It was 5.6. Can I reject the null hypothesis? I, well, my, my critical value that I must exceed is 3.8. The value that I actually calculated was 5.6. So the chi-square I calculated exceeds the critical value. It's a big enough number for me to reject my null hypothesis. What was my null hypothesis again? That there's no association between eating the tuna salad or not eating the tuna salad. What's my alternative? That there is an association between eating the tuna salad and getting sick. Okay, so... I can reject my null hypothesis except my alternative hypothesis. Now, if it had been a uh, two degrees of freedom, I couldn't have done that because the critical value would have been 5.99. And I didn't exceed that number. But that would have only have uh, been a situation where it would have been maybe a two by three table. You know, like instead of, uh, instead of sick or not sick, you know, maybe sick, got a little queasy, or didn't get sick. 
or something like that. You know, so anything that would give us a third column or row. You know, or he only ate a little of it. If you ate tuna salad, ate a lot of the tuna salad, ate a little of the tuna salad, ate no tuna salad, right? So, so um, uh, uh, that happens. You get studies like that. And I'm going to, you know, at some point, if not tonight, I'll, I'll show you one of those kinds of studies. Okay. And, and, there, and then those cases where you're looking for is if the association is a little bit stronger, depending on what your exposure was. Okay. So, so pretty simple. Right, so you guys could actually sit down and calculate this. Okay, so now I'm gonna I'm gonna um, 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 uh, take another look at this from another perspective. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna take my um, observed values. Okay, I'm gonna copy them over here. I'm gonna I'll take the whole table. Okay, I'm gonna uh, open up another page here, another sheet here. Oops, don't want to do that. Okay, I got something else going on there. I'll paste these in here. Okay, here we go. Um, I don't like that. Let me do it this way so I go over and read it. You can read it. Okay, so uh, how are you guys doing online, by the way? And, uh, I'm trying not to ignore you guys. I don't see any uh, questions so far online. Well, I'm gonna take a. I'm gonna stop for a moment after I do this and take a few questions because I, the next thing I'm gonna look at. I look at it another way of interpreting the same data, and that is, what's the probability that someone that ate tuna, tuna that ate the tuna fish got sick? What risk were they at? How am I going to calculate that? Well, 46 people ate the tuna salad, 19 of them got sick. So the rate, the risk, the risk of the rate, I can you can describe it either way. Okay, doesn't matter. The, rate, the risk or rate at which they got sick was 19 out of 46. How about the risk or the rate for people that didn't eat the tuna salad? Well, the risk that they, had, that they had was 10 out of 52. Oh, well, look at that. 41% of the people that ate the tuna salad got sick. 19% of the people that didn't eat the tuna salad got sick. So their risk was 41%. These guys' risk was only 19%. Well, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to say something else here. Let's, let's define something called relative risk. Okay? And relative risk is going to be equal to the ratio of the risk for the people that were exposed over the people that were not exposed. And I can see it's only, it looks like it's twice as likely that if you ate it, you got sick. In fact, the risk of getting ill if you ate the tuna, sa no, tuna salad was 2.14, 2.15 times the risk that if you didn't eat the tuna salad. That's called relative risk. That's easy to understand, right? You, I, I took, I took. Let's, I'll do it again. Okay. First of all, the risk of the, the risk or the rate, right? I could call this relative risk or relative rate, right? The risk was 19 out of 47, 19 over 46, and 10 over 52 for the two groups. The relative risk was 41% for the group that ate it over 19% for the group that didn't eat it. Okay. So now let's say that there was uh, there was uh, ham sandwiches at the picnic also, right? You might have found out well people probably did not eat the tuna salad and the ham sandwiches. They probably have one or the other. You might have found that the risk for people, if I said ate ham sandwiches or did not eat ham sandwiches, and the people that didn't eat the ham sandwiches probably had the tuna salad. So in fact, the rate at which the people got sick that ate the ham sandwiches might be a lower risk than the people that did not eat it. So in effect, you would get a relative risk that was less than one, which would be protective. You would say that eating the ham sandwiches might have been a bit protective. Okay, so let me ask you this. If there's no difference between the rate of illness for getting, eating the tuna salad versus not eating the tuna salad, what would I expect the relative risk to be equal to? One, right? You expect the same rate. You expect both, uh, you know, 10% for one group and 10% for the other group if it had nothing to do with that, right? So that's what we're interested in. We're interested in seeing whether the relative risk is different than one. In this case, the relative risk is 2.14. That's a point estimate. Right for relative risk, what we really need to know is what's what is the 
what is the confidence interval for this relative risk? Because then I can look at the confidence interval and see if what important number is inside that interval. One. If one is inside that interval, I can't be 95% certain that it's different than one. But if one is outside of that interval, I can be 95% certain. And I can use that to reject the null hypothesis. Well, now I'm going to show you another way of doing this, which is really completely unintuitive, especially if you don't play the ponies. If you play the ponies, you go to OT. Uh, there's no, uh, I'm dating myself. There's no OTB anymore. But New York City managed to be the only bookie that ever went out of business. But that's a whole other that's a whole other thing. So at any rate, so if you ever go to the racetrack, you see the odds. Now notice I don't say risk or rate, I say odds. You see the odds on a horse are four to one. Right? Does that mean the horse is four times as likely to lose as win? Not really. They calculate this a little bit differently. Four to one odds at a racetrack means if they run the race five times they expect the horse to lose four times and win one time that's the way they that's the way they calculate the odds we're going to do the same thing here okay how many people got sick 19 how many people didn't get sick 27 so what are the odds of getting sick it's 19 to 27 right which is i guess about one uh, two out of three right something like that so my odds for eating the tuna salad, getting sick is equal to 19 over 27. Not over 46, but over 27. So my odds of getting sick are 70%, right? 4.7, right? 19 out of 27. So what are the odds of getting sick if you didn't eat the tuna salad? Well, 10 people got sick and 42 did not get sick, right? So the odds for them was 0.238. So naturally, I want to compare those two odds. If there's no difference between the two groups, I would expect its odds to be the same for both groups. So I would expect my odds ratio to be equal to what I what would I expect it to be? One. one, right? So if it's different than one, that's what makes it interesting for me. So that's equal to this divided by this, and my odds ratio is two point nine. Is it exactly the same as the relative risk? No. Okay. Is it close? Yeah. When you have a relatively low uh, low prevalence outcome, as we deal with very often in public health, the numbers are going to be very close. Only when you have very high prevalence and small samples that the numbers may start to diverge a bit. And in fact, the odds ratio tends to exaggerate uh, 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 the difference, which I don't know. I guess for some studies, maybe that's what they're after sometimes, you know? Who knows? Okay. So at any rate, so again, my main interest here is now I got an odds ratio of 2.9, but I'm not done. I really need to know whether that point ratio, whether the, whether the, whether the confidence interval for that 2.9 is, say, 0.5 to 4, in which case I can't exclude 1, or if it's 3.5 to, if, if it's uh, 2.5 to 3.5, in which case I can exclude 1 and reject my null hypothesis, because then I can say with 95% certainty it's not one. So we have to calculate a confidence interval for the relative risk or for the odds ratio if we really want to apply it. Okay, problem with that is, well, well how would we do that? Well, in fact, we have proportions here, right? And we did, we did confidence intervals around proportions. It's going to get a little complicated here, especially uh, in the, in the uh, um, you know, as we deal with these two different proportions. It's going to get it's going to start to get a bit com complicated when we combine them and so on and so forth. So typically, we're not ever going to ask you to actually calculate that by hand. Chi-square, easy to calculate by hand, right? Okay. Odds ratio is going to be a little, odds ratio, relative risk, confidence interval for them. Odds ratio, relative risk, easy to calculate. The confidence interval for them, a little bit more complicated. So we're going to stay away from that. We're going to use SPSS to do that. So I'm going to go through an example. I'm going to go through the same example now using SPSS. Okay, I actually started it up before we uh, got into this. By the way, there's a update for SPSS on the Mac, the version 23.002 or something like that. And it doesn't run any faster, but it seems a little stable. So um, you, might, you might consider downloading it. 
It doesn't really make it right. It still takes ages for it to open up. Okay. But I guess that's something anyway. Okay, so oops, that's not the one I want. Let's see what this one is. Oh, that's the output. That's okay. We'll go over here. Open data. Okay, and I have this on here. Some tuna surprise. That's it. I, I'm not sure I uploaded this. I think it's uploaded with a different name because uh, I kind of changed this as I was kind of talking about it. Oh, well, look at this. This is very interesting. In SPSS, the data is organized differently than it is in Excel, right? In, SP, in SPSS, we actually work with the raw data, the actual individuals, individual number one. Well, what is one and what is uh, one tuna surprise and illness? What does that stand for? I'll go to the variable view. And in fact, it looks like a tuna surprise, the variable tuna surprise stands for whether or not they ate the tuna, right? And if I click into the values, one means they ate the tuna, two means they didn't eat the tuna, right? And if I look over here at illness, uh, one means they developed a gastrointestinal intestinal illness and two means they didn't develop it. I tend to use the lower number for the exposure. Like, in other words, I wouldn't use two for didn't need the tuna. I would use one for didn't need the I would use two for didn't need the tuna and one for did eat the tuna. Lower number for the exposure itself. I would also use the lower number for the, uh, 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 for the outcome. Ill, uh, one for illness, two for not ill. Why do I do that? Because SPSS, when it organizes the output, it tends to it tends to use it tends to organize it so that uh, 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 that the outputs are clearer if you have uh, uh, the the uh, exposure in the top row and the illness in the left column. And you'll see why I say that when I do the outcome. But if you do that, I think it'll make it a little easier for you. Uh, and in fact, you can go in there and edit this or transpose it if somebody put it in there a different way. But at any rate, okay, so that's what those note, that's what those stand for. I can't see that here, can I? I can go up to view, I can tell it to show the value labels, and now you can actually see what each one of these people, this person over here ate the tuna but didn't become ill, this person did not eat the tuna but didn't become ill, and so on and so forth. Right, and there's 98 people. It's the same as the study we just looked at. So I'm going to go through this one step at a time. Okay, I'm going to go up to analyze and First thing I want to do is organize this into tables, right? Because right now it's just individuals listed this way. I'm going to go up here and analyze. It happens that it's in under descriptive statistics. There's a selection called crosstabs where we can generate these tables. So I'm going to go in there. I'm going to say, okay, let's look at the exposure. The exposures I want to put into the rows. And the exposure is exposure to tuna surprise or eight to tuna surprise. The columns is the outcome, develop, whether or not they develop gastrointestinal illness. I'll put that in there. Okay, so now statistics. I'm going to click on that. You know, nothing selected yet. I'm not going to do anything there yet. I'm going to go into cells instead. And the only thing selected right now is observed values. Okay, so the only thing it's going to give us in the output is the observed values. I'm going to say OK and see what comes up in the output. Okay, here we go. Let's see what came up in the output. Let me do this. I can raise it a little bit so you can see it. Okay, so how many people uh, ate the tuna? 19 who became ill who ate the tuna. 27 didn't. 46 total. These are the same numbers that we got in our Excel sheet, right? So all this did for us was take those 98 people and organize it into a cell. But certainly it saved us a lot of trouble counting them and accumulating that data, correct? Even just doing that. What's the next interesting thing I might want to look at? How about the expected values? Let me see another table that shows me what the expected values are so that I don't have to calculate my own expected value table. So I'm going to analyze. Uh, oops. You want to know something that started when I did the update? It's more stable, but notice when I'm in the output table, I don't see, I don't see descriptive statistics. But when I go to the when I go to the uh, data view, 
it reappears like magic. I have no idea why. Okay, uh, I'll go into cross tabs. Okay, now I'm going to go back into cells. And this time I'm also going to check expected values. Okay, let me click continue. And I'm going to say, okay. Amazing how slow it is, right? Okay, so anyway, okay, let's take a look at what we have. Well, it didn't generate two tables. It generated one table, but it put the expected values into the same cells. 19, 13.6, 10, and 15.4. These are all the same numbers that we calculated when we did our expected values. And how did we do that? We used the, the, uh, 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 the uh, uh, prevalence that we calculated, the overall prevalence that we calculated. Okay, so, so this gave us our expected and observed values. So I'm going to go back again. And notice, of course, we're going to do this all at once, but I, I wanted you to get a look at this as we develop each piece of this information. Descriptive statistics, cross tabs, okay? And this time, I'm going to go into statistics. And I'm going to say, okay, let's calculate the chi-square value for these. Remember, that's going to be calculated. It's going to be calculated based on the observed values minus the expected values squared divided by the uh, expected values for each one of those four cells, right, all added together. Okay, click Continue, click OK, and this time when the output table comes up, we're going to have our tables, and we're going to have our chi-square value. And there we go. Okay, here, here is our um, uh, a table again, just repeated what we got before, and here is our chi-square table. And here we go, look at this. We have the Pearson's chi-square, which is the one you would have calculated in Excel and came out to exactly the same thing, or roughly we rounded a bit, came out to the same thing, 5.7. Okay, how many degrees of freedom? One degree of freedom. Well, unlike the table, where all we could do with the table is look up the one degree of freedom, how big a chi-square do I need to reject the null hypothesis? And look up that number, it was 3.84, right? Well, in this case, it goes a step further it actually gives you a p-value, a probability value of being wrong if you reject the null hypothesis. The probability that there's no association with this size sample that uh, 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 you would get this big, this, this big a number for chi-square. Okay? And that is 0 0.017, right? Or, or a little less than 2%. So what is our expected value for chi-square? Well, I mean, excuse me. What is our uh, alpha error, our acceptable level of alpha error? Five, less than 5%. We don't want it to be less than 5%. So this is 2%, so we reject our null hypothesis. We have only a 2% chance of being wrong, as opposed to a 5% chance of being wrong. Okay, so it gives us a little bit more understanding of what our data is like, right? Not just, you know, that we did or did not exceed the critical value. We have some other stuff that's there that we're going to get to in a second. And in fact, if we want we can actually, it actually gives us the continuity correction. Subtracting that half, because it's a two by two table, subtracting that half from each one of the cells. And it gives us a different number for chi-square. It gives us 4.7. Remember we said that's more conservative because it's gonna make each square number, to make each one of them smaller. If before we square it, we take away half. <clears throat> it comes out to be 4.96. Fortunately, even with the continuity correction, it's still less than 0.05. So we still reject our null hypothesis. Okay, so if you have a table like this, this might be a good way for you to evaluate and see if you're looking to see if there's an association between uh, 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 um, um, whether or not a person has a private physician or not, and the, uh, the uh, likelihood that in the last 12 months they went to an emergency room, you could have in the rows, private physician, no, uh, no private physician and private physician, and in the columns, uh, was that an emergency room for an asthma attack or was not at an emergency room for asthma attack? And you can compare those two to see if there's an association there, right? So now that won't really tell that will only tell you that there that there is an association or there isn't an association. It won't tell you much about what direction the association is or how big it is. That's why we like odds ratio and relative risk. Because now it'll tell us, oh, they were twice as likely or three times as likely to go to an emergency room if they didn't have a private position. So let's take a look at how we might work that. So I'm going to go back to Analyze, Analyze, 
descriptive statistics cross tabs. Okay, and now I'm going to go into cells. I'm going to turn off the expected values because it gets a little messy. I'm going to find percentages by rows. I'm going to click continue. And I'm going to click OK. What it's going to do, it's going to find a percentage by rows of these various outcomes. In other words, our risk or our risk rate, our risk, our risk or our rate. Okay, and what do we find here? Uh, 19 out of 46 people ate the tuna salad. 41% got sick. 41% of them got sick. Um, uh, while 10 out of 52 or 19% didn't eat the tuna salad. So 19, so my risk is 41% for ate the tuna salad, 19% for didn't eat the tuna salad. Well, that's nice. I have my risk. But now I don't have my odds ratio, though, no, right? My odds ratio would be 19 over 27, be a different number. So I'm going to calculate that a little bit differently. I'm going to go back up here. To an Oops. I'm going to go over here. Analyze. Descriptive statistics cross tabs. And I'm going to go back here into statistics. I'm going to click off risk. It's going to calculate my risk and my odds ratio with that button clicked off now. I'm going to click uh, continue and I'm going to click OK. OK, and let's see what we get this time. Well, we got the same result for the chi-square test, right? Nothing's changed, right? But if you notice, I got another box down here. Risk estimate. Okay, it gave me an odds ratio for exposure, and it gave me a, uh, uh, for cohort developed GI illness uh, equals, it gives me another value down here that it doesn't describe quite as well. Well, I recognize that number. That number was my relative risk. This number is my odds, it does identify as odds ratio. It's my odds ratio. Remember when we calculated, we got roughly the same amount. Now, that's a point estimate, right? That is what we think it is based on this sample. Now we want to know what the confidence interval is for the odds ratio. And the confidence interval is, uh, well, we're 95% certain that it's between 1.2 and 7.3. Is it different than 1? Yes. So I can reject my null hypothesis, right? I'm not so impressed by that anymore like I was by the chi-square, am I? Right. Well, what about my uh, relative risk? It's similarly, uh, my 95% confidence interval is 1.1 1 .1 to 4.3, uh, um, 135. It also excludes one, so I can also use that to reject my null hypothesis. But now, see, when I see that three times, I'm a little bit chastened here because I know my, not, my confidence interval is pretty wide for this. So it gives me a bit more information about it how much confidence that I really have in this. I have enough to reject the null hypothesis, but I don't have an overwhelming amount of confidence here, do I? Right, because I'm not that far off from having missed it because of the width of my confidence interval. So we were able to calculate chi-square. We were able to, and, I, and in fact, I could have just checked off chi-square, risk, and whatever else I wanted, have the whole output all at once. But I just wanted to go through it so you could see how we could develop this, how this actually is analogous to what we just did on paper. Okay, so I got I think I have another example that you guys can use, which is called stenosis. And there's, there is a version on Blackboard for stenosis, an SPSS file.sav, that you can download to your desktop. And if you want, you can give that a try. I'm going to give you guys five minutes or five or ten minutes. To give it a try on your own, calculate the, uh, create a, a cross tab table, calculate the, uh, also uh, create a cross tab table that has both the, uh, 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 the expected values and the observed values, and also uh, the uh, uh, relative, uh, also the risks, and then also produce a table that make, gives us the chi-square value and the uh, 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 odds ratio and relative risk and determine whether or not you can reject the null hypothesis. Now, the, the idea of this uh, 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 table for stenosis, let me go find it myself. Yeah, there's three variables. One of them is, is gender. You can, you can ignore gender. 
So the one I'm interested in is, ones I'm interested in, as I go to the variable view, ones I'm interested in is smoking status and presence of disease. Stenosis means thickening of the arteries, right? Hardening of the arteries. So whether or not they, they, they have, uh, uh, if they have an, a presence of aortic stenosis, a narrowing or a thickening of the aorta, right? And, you know, I'm thinking maybe there's an association between smoking and the presence of stenosis. So let's compare those. So the exposure is smoking, right, first variable. The outcome is whether or not they have stenosis. And if I click in here, I say yes. Uh, 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 one is uh, yes for smoking, two is no, kind of like what I want. Okay, and one is yes for aor aortic stenosis, and two is no. So I'll give you guys a chance to maybe work that out in SVSS. You guys online, you might want to try that uh, as well. Okay, you have your choice whether you want to just you know do them all at once or. So quiet, frightening. Very uncomfortable. You know? Most professors like to hear their own, love the sound of their own voices. You know? If I have stopped talking. That's why I feel so uncomfortable in this time. Anybody has to listen to sports radio? They say some really idiotic stuff on sports radio. And, and I'm convinced that the reason why that happens, you ever hear them stop talking for even like five seconds? That's what they call on the radio dead air, right? You will not hear silence on a sports radio station for more than five seconds ever. So you got these guys that are on the air for like four hours or something like that. And they can't, you know, like, I mean, they don't, they don't even, change, you know, whatever's in their mouth is going to come out. Right. So they say just incredible things. <laughs> and I'm convinced it's because they're, they're allergic to dead air. It's not like they can never stop. Uh, let me get my thoughts organized for 30 seconds. And then, like, dead quiet for 30 seconds. They, everybody in the world is changing the station, like, you know, banging on their antenna or something like that. It's not, same is probably true for, like, the political, you know, like political talk stations. But listen to it. Next time, listen specifically for the longest amount of time that there's just dead air, that anybody actually stops to think about what they're going to say before they say it. <laughs> Hi, thank you, Chris. Can you see the comments? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, most most famous statisticians are dead anyway, right? <laughs> you don't hear about too much, you know, new statistics, right? I'm going to give you three three more minutes, and then I'll, I'll run through the uh, example. And I think for the most part, you're going to be using SPS for these things, especially if, you, if you're doing something with your project. You have like enormous. And you, when you when you when you look at uh, maybe you know maybe uh, this week online, I, I don't think this was this stuff was, itself was too complicated. I'll keep my eye on how you guys are progressing on the quiz for this week. But uh, maybe this week we, we can spend a little bit of time looking, using EpiQuery and looking at the New York City health survey, community health survey, to see how you can extract some information from it and how you can use it and stuff. 
I guess most of you guys have already started that because you had to do some descriptive statistics. But you know, may, maybe we'll spend a little bit of time on that so we can find some interesting uh, data. Mo almost all of the data on there is categorical, right? Because I mean, you know what I'll do? I think it would be worthwhile talking about downloading the data or gathering the data from there and then organizing it in a way that it's useful to you. Because there's many variables where like there are seven possible answers. Right, three of which are totally irrelevant or didn't answer or some other thing. And then the others, you know, you might want to combine because one of the things you're going to notice is, is that if there's more than one, uh, uh, if there's more than one row or column, if there's more than one, uh, uh, two rows, that you're not going to be able to calculate odds ratios of relative risk. They'll tell you, I can't do that because it can only compare those two numbers. So I'll show you ways that you can get around that because I think it'll come up for quite a few of you. You can recode the data in SPSS. I think maybe if we have a little separate thing we can record online uh, that shows you how to recode data that you got, you got from uh, uh, the Community Health Survey that may help you guys out. Oh, there's no, there's no quiz this week? No. Oh. How come? She said to use that time to write Oh, okay. Never mind. All right. Okay. Well, if you're having issues with it, if you're having issues understanding this, email me and I'll I'll work out like maybe we'll do a little you know, even half hour. Just to, just to kind of cement it. Okay, I'm going to give it a try on my computer, and then we'll call it a night. Okay, see if we got the same answers. I'm going to go to Analyze, Descriptive Statistics, and I'm going to go down to Crosstabs. Okay, so my exposure goes in the rows, and my exposure in this case is smoking status. My outcome for disease goes in the columns, okay, which is presence of aortic stenosis. One is yes, it's there. Two is no, it's not there. So now in statistics, I'm going to want to calculate a chi-square statistic, and I'm going to want to calculate my risks, odds ratio and relative risk. Okay, so I'm okay there. Now in my cells, uh, maybe I want to, not just the observed values, I want the expected values, and I want the percentages by rows. Let's say I'll just go for the whole Monty, whole Monty menu, and then I'm going to click OK. Let's see what I get for an output. Okay, here we go. Takes forever, right? Yeah, amazing. Okay, so here we go. Here's our table that summarizes our our data. So our 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 observed values are more are labeled count. Fifty four people, uh, uh, fifty four smokers had stenosis. Forty did not. Out of this, this is obviously a high risk population. Okay, um, I expected forty two point eight of them to have stenosis. Turned out fifty four of them actually did. Uh, 44 of them didn't. Uh, if they were no, if there was no association, I would have expected 55 to have it in this group. Okay, and the percentages: 57% in this group had stenosis, 36% in this group had stenosis. 57 over 36 is about I don't know about one, one point one and a half or something like that, roughly, right? So it looks like they're one, the relative risk should be about one and a half. Let's take a look at our chi-square values. Okay, chi-square, Pearson's chi-square was 9.48. I know instantly that I can reject my null hypothesis because I remember for one degree of freedom, all I need is a chi-square of 3.84. And in fact, my le my significance, my, my probability of being wrong if I reject the null hypothesis is less than 1%. Okay, 
Now, it does say two-sided. We could see this was only a one-sided test, right? Because it's only looking at the tail on one end. They, I presume they call it two-sided just to let you know don't bother to double this number because it, is, it, 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 it includes all of the probabilities you have to worry about. Okay, so, so the probability is low. Okay, even with the continuity correction, it's still very low uh, probability of being wrong if we reject the null hypothesis. How, is, how do we phrase the null hypothesis here? Uh, there's no association between smoking and aortic stenosis. Alternative hypothesis, there is an association between uh, 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 smoking and aortic stenosis. Okay, in this case, we reject the null hypothesis and we accept the alternative hypothesis. If this number had been bigger than 0.05, we would have failed to reject the null hypothesis. We don't say we would have accepted the null hypothesis because that's not what we were trying to prove. And that's not what this is designed to do. We just say we failed to reject it. Okay, so what about our odds ratio, relative risk and odds ratio? Well, the point value for odds ratio is 2.36, uh, and the confidence interval is 1.3 to 4.1, so I know that confirms the fact that I can reject it, and it gives quantifies for me how big the difference is between the, the people, the risk, uh, how big the difference the odds are for the people that smoke versus don't, don't smoke, and a little bit easier to understand is the relative risk, and the relative risk, I, we said it was about one and a half, in, term, in fact, comes out to be 1.58. So in this population, you're 1.58 times as likely to develop a, uh, to have developed aortic stenosis if you were a smoker versus if you weren't a smoker. Increase your risk by 58%. Okay? This is the inverse of the, uh, of the uh, relative risk. Right? So, but you don't have to worry about it. The only time you'd have to worry about that is if you rearrange this so the illness was on the low number, the high number, and no illness was the low number, and you'd get the invert, inverse answer. In other words, if you just, uh, uh, 1 over 1.58 turns out to be 0 0.669. So I wouldn't worry about it uh, if you wind up organizing it neatly. Okay, so I hope you guys online did this. I hope this was not too lame, an explanation of this. Right? Was it okay? Okay, good. You know, because... Fail to reject, right? Right, because because you haven't you haven't found a big enough number, big enough difference between those four cells to say that yeah, these things are really different. In other words, the difference between the expected values and the observed values are not enough to amount to big enough difference to say yeah, I really see that there's a difference between what I would have expected if there's no association versus what I actually observed. So, and you do that, you can actually do this. You have the numbers here, 54, 40, 44, and 77. You could calculate, you know, actually they even gave you the expected values. You could actually calculate the chi-square by hand uh, in Excel if you wanted to, you know, to see what the number is. Okay, and remember, if it's more than, if, if in SPSS, they're going to tell you what the degrees of freedom are. It's going to do all the calculations, gives you... Gives you the probability of wrong if you reject null hypothesis or your, your P for you to compare to alpha. It'll do all that for you, right? A little bit sloppier if you use Excel because you have to do all that for yourself. And then you have to go to the table to look up the critical value for that particular number of columns and rows that you have in your particular distribution uh, in order to determine if you can reject the null hypothesis.